This is a recording of a three-way discussion held on the 5th of October about the astrology of this year's New Zealand general election, happening just as we are about to enter a powerful eclipse portal opened by the Ring of Fire on the 15th of October. The idea for this was birthed by Iselda. I'll let her explain in her own words. I'm particularly keen to talk about or to look into um, the birth chart, or in this case, charts of New Zealand around the election, because I noticed that the election was right on the cusp of a solar eclipse. And usually in New Zealand, with our MMP voting system, we end up with um, a, a group of different political parties in governance together, forming coalitions. And that can take a couple of weeks sometimes for them to work that out. And a couple of weeks after the solar eclipse is the lunar eclipse. And I thought that's pretty auspicious. It's got to mean something. But what? Hi, my name's Leanne. I'm a New Zealander. And I just returned here after more than 20 years living in the UK. I started studying astrology in 2020. I call myself an astrologist, astro enthusiast, or just plain astro nut, depending on my mood. I'm drawn to aspect patterns and the symbolic language of the zodiac. Much like my Samoan and Viking ancestors, I am a navigator of stars, not for journeying external waters, but for journeying internal waters. I've developed my very own art of astrology. I create digital soul portraits from the planetary patterns and vibrations contained in the star map for the moment of birth of a person, place or event. These star maps are known as the birth chart or the natal chart in astrology. I am joined in this conversation by two friends. Iselda, a fellow Kiwi astrologist, who specialises in vibrational astrology. I'm Ms. Elder. I've been interested in astrology and, and sort of learning about it since February last year, 2022. And this is my very first uh, public appearance speaking about astrology. So a little bit nerve-wracking, but very excited about this. So... When I started looking into astrology, I didn't begin with any particular understanding of why I was suddenly obsessively wanting to know everything <laughs> about the subject. And I was surprised to find within astrology a whole lot of familiar subjects that I really enjoyed looking at through an astrological lens. And they were some subjects that I'd been interested in prior and some not so much, but things like geometry, fractals, pattern recognition like Leanne, um, astronomy, because I live in the country and I get to see the night stars these days, research, quantum ideas, mysticism, philosophy, psychology, and even biology, form and function, which I'm well familiar with. The lens of astrology, I think, can best be described as a symbolic language, and that's what I've been fascinated by learning. And I'm especially intrigued by how we arrive at meanings and interpretations for all of this stuff going on up there. So that's the best that I can explain my interest in, in astrology. It didn't take me long. It might have been maybe two months to discover a form of astrology called vibrational astrology, as per the teachings of David Cochran. I've been deep diving ever since. And although I have not undertaken formal astrology studies, and I'm not a qualified vibrational astrologer. I have got my hands on the Sirius software, which is some super duper astrology software and allows me to um, go more deeply into vibrational astrology than perhaps some of the other software out there. And Felina, a professional astrologer from Omaha, who brings her wealth of client experience to the conversation as well as the mundane perspective. My name is Felina Kavi. I am an astrologer and a priestess of Gaia. I've been an astrologer for almost two decades now. And mostly what I do or have done is definitely client work throughout. So working 
one on one or sometimes more than one uh, with people and with their birth charts um, or uh, relationship charts with multiple people. And I also love to write about astrology. And for a while I was doing a blog, but at the moment I am writing a book, which we requires me to just focus in my writer's cave. Then Leanne asked me if I wanted to do this. And I was like, yes, because this sounded like fun. And I got to astro nerd out on it. What I do is what I call astro animism. And I am linking the living earth to the living sky, just very simply. But it's also about how all of these things, the planets and everything on earth, not just us, has life, has spirit, has soul, and has meaning. Before tuning into our conversation, I just want to give you an idea of what to expect. Timestamps will also be included in the description in case you just want to skip ahead. We start with an examination of the election chart. Then we move on to how the election affects the country. For that, we had to arrive at and agree the birth of New Zealand as a country. We couldn't pick just one, so we've examined two charts. The first date of birth we used was for the treaty signed between the indigenous Māori and the British Crown, known as Te Tiriti or Waitangi, 1840. It is the basis for New Zealand's national day and annual holiday called Waitangi Day. The second date we've used is when New Zealand was formally established as a self-governing nation via the New Zealand Constitution Act, 18. In astrology, you interpret the effects of the current sky on the birth map, and we interpret the ongoing movement of the planets during an event, like an election. For those non-astrologers out there, here's some basics to lay the groundwork of our discussion for you before we begin. This is the star map also known as an astrology chart, birth chart, or natal chart. It is a horoscope derived from the Greek words aura and skopos, meaning time and observer. On the left-hand side, I've listed the mundane indicators at the top, which is the sun, the moon, the ascendant, which is where the horizon is, the midheaven, and then Pluto. So when you look at the circle, you're actually looking, if you imagine you're looking at Earth and the horizon is right through the middle or the equator is right through the middle. So what is above is above the horizon and what is below is below the horizon and in some respects hidden. So you have hidden, beneath and above visible. Those are just two basic uh, ways of looking at this and hopefully will make sense as we go through our discussion. What I have also done in these charts is made sure that the points we're talking to are in white and a bit larger than the rest so that you can actually spot them quickly. Then you've got the zodiac wheel here and like I say, the mundane indicators, mundane form of astrology as opposed to mundane and boring. It's not mundane and boring. <laughs> and then you will notice that I talk through symbols. Uh, these symbols are the Sabian symbols and they were channeled by Elsie Wheeler. And Mark Edmund Jones helped her capture what was channeled on an unrecorded date in 1925. And then a person by the name of Dane Rudyard brought their work into prominence and popularized the Sabian symbols. I talk about where I source my information as part of the video so that if this is something that interests you, watch out for that part of the discussion. Ready? Let's go explore the astrology of New Zealand's election on the entrance to a powerful eclipse portal. This is the birth chart for 
the election that is coming up. I have timed it at 7 p.m. on the 14th of October because that is the time that voting closes. And I've chosen Wellington because that is the capital city and that is where government lives. That's where the parliament sits. It is a bit of a giggle for me because my friend Pluto, a woman reading tea leaves. <laughs> it's like it's anybody's guess who is going to come out of this election as the government. And then I found it really fascinating the ascendant, a serpent coiling near a man and a woman. Mm, what does that mean? And then We've got the sun and the moon very close to one another just prior to the eclipse. The sun, a Sunday crowd enjoying the beach, sounds fabulous. The moon, not so fabulous. After a storm, a boat landing stands in need of reconstruction. And then the midheaven, school grounds filled with boys and girls in gymnasium suits. For me, this paints a really, really interesting picture. But then I've gone ahead and looked at the strongest pattern. This is a yod, a more traditional yod, or traditional in terms of traditional aspects in astrology. So I've got in brackets there, finger of God. This is called a projection figure in aspect pattern astrology because there's a branch of astrology called aspect pattern astrology. And this is called a projection figure. Black Moon Lilith features Black Moon Lilith in Leo. So this is that female principle coming through many little birds on the limb of a big tree. The projection figure actually starts with Lilith is projecting out to the two points held by Pluto and Neptune. Out to the woman reading tea leaves, out to a very thin crescent moon. I don't have any answers, just questions when I look at this. Our friend Pluto in Capricorn, a woman reading tea leaves. And here we are, the three of us, women. <laughs> um, <laughs> about, about to talk about this election and spreading the tea leaves out or... <laughs> or the bones or whatever it is that we read. Um, okay. Actually, most uh, the three of us prefer reading astrology, but some of us have other things. We do tarot, stuff like that. But yes, we, um, it's, a, it's a woman divining, right? Pluto here, just underneath everything. I think a, a lot of the people in your country would like to be able to divine what the best strategy is moving forward and that Pluto has that particular symbol is I, I like it the other thing that I wanted to mention oh just real quickly also so the black moon here the black moon Lilith um, it is the apogee of the moon apogee means farthest from earth Apo meaning far, and G referring to Gaia or the earth. So when the moon is close to the black moon, that means she's farther away from earth than she would be if it was, for example, a super moon, which is when the moon is close to perigee or opposite the black moon. So I just wanted to say that, that here for this election, we have kind of a far away moon not far far away because it's not right at the black moon but it's still pretty far away in relation to what it can be when it's a super moon with that being said the moon of this chart then as it represents the people there's there's a lot of really personal issues affecting the people of new zealand at this time and for this election I'm guessing by this that there's this feeling of being distanced from it, distance from feeling distance from the government or the, you know, the options that are usually there are not quite feeling like that they're speaking to the people. 
that's that's how I would see a faraway moon in this. What ends up happening here is that we have a sextile, which is um, a harmonious 60 degree aspect of opportunity at the base. And then it points with these what's called quincunx aspects, which are 150 degrees apart. And they're not really aspects, so I can't even really call it an aspect because aspect means to see and in in this way, those are the parts of the chart that don't see where the black moon is. Of course, you can't see the black moon anyway because it's it's not a physical body. It is just a point in the um, moon's orbit. But uh, what this means is that that's pointing to this place in the chart that there is a there's an opportunity if you can get past the uncomfortable I can't f see this these things aren't working together very well because they're so different. Oftentimes we want to compartmentalize those two very different things, but what this aspect pattern is showing is that you have to work them together, however uncomfortable, then you get to this, whatever this magical reason is that Gaia is pointing her finger to this place. I am going to move over to my own slide. That's really intriguing that the two non aspects they're they're known as a blind spot as well, that the two blind spots are pointing to a spot that is also dark, the black moon. And isn't that how a lot of people are feeling that everybody might be reading their tea leaves or their astrology or doing their tarot ahead of this time and nobody can figure it out. Yeah, like what's going to yeah. happen? It's very much the feeling of the dark moon before an eclipse as well. Or even who am I going to vote for? You well, know? yeah, exactly. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah who, I very much find myself in that situation as someone who's always been so clear headed and, and strong willed about my politics. I find mm -hmm. myself um, for the first time being an undecided voter so close to the election. I would desperately love to read the tea leaves right, but everything I come up with and everything you guys seem to come up with is saying, yeah, no, you're just going to have to wait and see. <laughs> and uh, de deciding on that internal tactic of how to vote, you know, you could go with some sort of majority strategy or you could go with, you know, who you really feel and believe in despite any particular strategies in mind. And, yeah, and who do you believe in and how and why? And so much to it. It's all very much in the dark, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it really comes down to who do you believe in more? Because believing wholeheartedly in any one person or party is probably not the way of this election, just from what I'm seeing. Here is the, the astrological chart for the election. I have it here as I usually read these charts. And so I have it with all of these aspects and it looks all confusing to a lot of people. This is how I read. Like this is like looking inside the, the cup and seeing how the tea leaves have scattered and arranged themselves. And that's how I read this chart. <clears throat> so confusing as it may look, Let's just kind of break a few of these elements down, maybe some of the more important elements. Um, it's all important, but as far as how, how the people are feeling, we always start with the moon, right? So up here, I have just some things written out so that I remember to say them. So the Libra moon is the people, and in this election, they're feeling like with Libra, they're feeling like they want things to be fair. Things need to be fair, not just for a few, you know, maybe like a few at the top, we could say. There's a lot going on here. You see all those red lines. I mean, even if you don't know astrology, 
you can tell from all of those red lines and the red dotted lines as well that there is a lot of stress going on in this country at this time. Not only is this post-COVID with everything that has happened with that, there's a lot of recovery in, in many ways. I was noticing that not too long ago, although I can't remember when it was, close to where you are, Zelda, there was massive flood damage. Cyclone. Yep, the I cyclone. live in the midst of that, and the damage will be visible on the surface for years because the time and effort and money is going into rebuilding the roads, not clearing away the damage. So all of that catastrophe is in our faces every day. Yep. It was the moon where we had the symbol, right, Leanne, of a boat landing washed away. Yes. Yeah. So it's like after a storm, you know, and this is multiple storms, not just like literal storm, like the cyclone, but multiple storms have devastated the people in Mm -hmm. a lot of different ways, whether it's, I know that the cost of living has to be horrendous there because it's it's not great anywhere really and and there i'm guessing it's a big deal so just like everybody's feeling a bit wiped out from fairly recent events that's this feeling of being in the dark of the moon and what i mean by dark of the moon for those who don't know just right before a new moon you're at the end of the cycle the end of a lunation cycle we've got about five and a half degrees before the moon is with the sun and we have that solar eclipse. In this dark of the moon, on our way to a solar eclipse, it is it is a heavy, like, I want to be done with this kind of feeling. So whatever it is that, the, that each individual person is feeling or has gone through, it's like, I don't want this to be my life anymore. Something's got to give, something's got to change. And you can see um, with the moon being in between Pallas Athena here, the wise warrioress uh, who's very strategic um, and also close to Mercury, there is this element of thinking and communicating wise strategy. Like that is what people are going to the polls to do. They want to have a strategy that is wise in moving ahead. And there's a lot to think about, so much to think about because, and some of it doesn't work with others because it's like you have to spend money to be wise in this way. But then if you spend too much money, then this, you know, goes to hell. What is the new beginning? And why does this new beginning that is coming in the solar eclipse, why does it have to have so much shadow? Not only why is it so shadowed that we can't see what's coming, but why is there so much heavy shadow that has yet to be worked through? I understand that that part is pretty heavy, but this is the reality of the situation. The people are feeling how heavy everything has been and everything could become if something isn't worked out. This moon is opposing Chiron. Chiron doesn't have to do only with wounds. Chiron was uh, an amazing teacher and mentor, as well as healer, as well as astrologer, by the way. I feel like Chiron is kind of like the cosmic shaman, is the way that I look at him. Many times, especially when we're looking at something that's not just about an individual person, but it's about many people, there is wounding that's coming up. The fact that the moon is across from Chiron means that it's reflecting on these past wounds. I say past wounds because Chiron is retrograde. And there's also a desire for healing. 
healing from these past wounds. And it could be recent past, it could be very far in the past, it could be all of those things, depending on the actual person who's going to vote. There's this feeling that because we have this opposition here and that's what the people are reflecting. By the way, I say reflecting with the moon because if the sun was over here and we had a full moon, the moon would be reflecting the sun's light. So whatever is opposite the moon, there is a reflection of it. I really feel for this, this particular aspect here because I have myself Chiron conjunct my ascendant opposite my moon. It's in different signs, but it is the same kind of thing. And it kind of feels like with this one, particularly with this uh, chart, that this ascendant being an Aries, it's very like, let's just do it. Let's get it done. But with Chiron there, it's like there, there's been some wounding so that that part of the national identity is, is hurting right now. All of this is then square to the midheaven. And at the midheaven, I think I mentioned this before, we have, you know, our leaders, people in power. Essentially with this, what is being said here is you don't see us. You you're not listening to us and you don't you don't care about what's going on here. You know, so it's putting the pressure on the people in power to actually follow through with the promises that they're making. And that kind of pressure from a T square like this, that's what this aspect pattern is called, a T square, that kind of pressure demands action and it can be harsh but really what it's about is that necessary change has to happen and that necessary change is pooling all of that stress from this opposition that the people are carrying and it's pooling it all at the top on these people who are promising this and that well, you better deliver is what that says Another part of this, I have this, I have picked out this eighth harmonic pattern, the hammer key. And it's kind of hard to see in this, but these dotted lines are what I am talking about. And so this is between Moon Mercury specifically. We're leaving Pallas out of this because we're being very exact about the, um, the orbs of these aspects. And Sedna, and here with Sedna is Alkyone, but Alkyone is from the Pleiades um, star cluster, which is also in Matariki, right? So Matariki, the mother, I just needed to put her in here. I wanted to see the kinds of things that would aspect that fixed star or that cluster because it seems to me that that would be very important to Aotearoa, New Zealand. And in this case, it really is because here we have Sedna. And now Sedna is from, is an ocean goddess from another part of the world, but she, really she represents kind of whatever the ocean deities are in each place. For the Maori, it is a god rather than a goddess but some of the storyline of sedna comes in as well just going to the next part saturn is in here saturn retrograde is also in this aspect pattern and again the mid heaven the hammer key going down here to these four different parts the moon mercury this is the thoughts and feelings of the voters what we've been talking about right and then saturn retrograde is the need for economic recovery after covid this is how I see it anyway. There's a lot that Saturn represents. When I put all of these things together, Saturn in Pisces, for example, that reminds me of when COVID came to all countries and lockdown started because it was right after a Mercury retrograde that went between Aquarius and Pisces. So it was right in that area. And here we have Saturn smack dab in the middle. 
it's bringing up that for me. Then Sedna, that part of it with Matariki, the rising sea levels, the climate impact, the climate crisis. I know for Aotearoa, it's it's a really big deal. I'm assuming, especially on the coast, that the rising sea levels are already being seen impacting the lives of of those on the coast. When I hear you talking about Setna and Pisces, when I hear you talking about Sedna and Masariki, I uh, front and center for me is the whole fishing rights, the whole issue about looking after our waters, the rivers, the the ocean waters. And this is connected the treaty agreements or breaking of those agreements. Um, it's all connected. I've only been back in New Zealand coming up a year in a couple of weeks. And there's this whole furor about three waters. And yeah, there's a lot of mm, angst about around the subject of water uh, in this yeah. country. Correct me if I'm wrong, Aselda, but that's what I've kind of picked up. I feel like there's a lot of debate and discussion around the subject of water. Yeah, I think definitely you hit the nail on the head with three waters. Um, yeah, and sometimes known as, what, what did it get up to, seven waters in the end or 11 waters? I, I don't know. But people are very concerned with the subject of water, for sure. Angst, that's a good word for it, for these these aspects, these eighth harmonic aspects, they are manifesting aspects and they are actional like squares. Um, but there's some angst, some underlying angst to them aside from the squares, because the squares really, like I said before, they really necessitate change. But then the eighth harmonics, which are, this is a semi square so half of a square 45 degrees and then these longer ones here these are the sesquiquadrates or sesquisquares which is 135 degrees and those are all eighth harmonics or eight vibration as you would say in vibrational astrology so what those feel like is this underlying tension it's not as front and center, everybody can see it as a square or an opposition. It's underlying and it feels like an itch that's hard to scratch. It's just irritation. And so all of these, you know, these four placements that I was talking about here, they all feel that angst or irritation with each other. So think about like the moon Mercury as the people that are going, you know, they're going to be voting for these mid heaven government leaders who are going to represent them and rise or fall the reputation of their country. And there's irritation between them. There is irritation between, you know, a lot of the aspects that Saturn will bring up and the th kinds of things that Sedna will bring up, for example, with Matariki, as well as Saturn with the Midheaven or Moon Mercury with Sedna. It's just they're all feeling like, how are we going to work this out? And one of the keys to this kind of aspect is looking at aspects that that alleviate by bringing it outside of this closed pattern because the closed pattern especially with the hammer key or just hammers in general so just one of these is called is often called thor's hammer thor's hammer is you know norse mythology but i'm sure you know most people understand what that means um, it's sometimes even called God's fist. I don't necessarily like that, but this is a really like smashing, crushing kind of aspect pattern. You know, people who have them in their natal chart, there's always this underlying feeling like I have to keep 
working at this all the time. It's so frustrating. I can't let it go or everything will fall apart. And so to have two of them working together and just locked in this pattern, you really have to look outside of that pattern for something that is bringing some relief. So one of the things that we can see is Jupiter here in a trine to the mid heaven. I mean, Jupiter represents luck. Um, also, sometimes like religious things, but also the judicial system. So it's also kind of like a law and order thing, which reminds me that when I asked about Winston Peters, Leanne, you told me he was a lawyer. And you also told me that he's like kingmaker, kind of, he's been kingmaker in this kind of thing, which is interesting because when I, when I listened to him, it didn't seem like that reflected a lot of the maybe like the younger generations um and so isn't it really important to new zealand in this vote for the younger generations to be voting i'm just you know i know that even here it's kind of hard to get young people to vote especially here there's been so many no offense because i'm not ageist or anything but really old people <laughs> been running here <laughs> in the united states so it's kind of hard to get um people out voting when they don't feel like they're being seen um just so to pose a question here is that is that something like are we are we getting young people inspired to vote or are they still feeling you know like they're not being seen well i um end up putting in a comment about engagement um a little bit later on and to fast forward to that basically i'm going to sort of hazard a guess <laughs> um that there will be fairly high engagement and we'll get to why. Um, whether that's from the youth or not, I don't know. And it, I, th I think there might be this sort of split idea going for a, a lot of people. Do I do I vote? If I do vote, who do I vote for? I think in the end, they're going to get motivated and, and vote. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so too. I, I mean, I hope so. You know, I bring up young people with Jupiter, that might seem a stretch, because usually we'd talk about, like, for example, Mercury with young people. But with Jupiter, I mean, Jupiter, Jove, this, this is a, it's where the term juvenile comes from. It, it does have to do with youth as well. So there is something there of the youth vote being really important. And I hope that it comes through with this trine to Jupiter, as well as Saturn and Jupiter here in a quintile aspect. So we're bringing up that fifth harmonic again. And there's some magic to be made here if we can get Jupiter, the kind of youthful vote working with the you know more traditional saturn the i've i've been doing this for a long time kind of saturn and those working together in kind of like a who would have thought kind of um improvisational aspect there one more thing i wanted to mention eris here is at the north node right eris is the goddess of chaos for you know for one thing she's discordia she she brings up strife and discord and that's what everybody's really feeling and yet it's also karmic directive being on one of the nodes to bring this kind of energy forth so eris upsets the apple cart She'll rock the boat. She will rock the boat. She, you know, she will buck the system. She'll do whatever she can. Whenever she finds something that's not in integrity, 
with itself anymore, whether it's a, a politician or a government or something like that, she will get in there and she will kind of expose it for for the flaws that it has. That's kind of the heiress energy. That being part of this chart and that being part of as we move forward through these eclipses, the fact that y'all are having your election and during this eclipse season, I mean, you kind of you kind of got to understand that there is an heiress element. There's a bit of a chaos element in there. And working with her is better than working against her. <clears throat> I can't remember which astrologer it is, but they call her Erezina. So Xena, warrior princess, uh, uh, just mm -hmm. for those people that aren't familiar with the heiress, um, there'll be a lot of people in New Zealand anyway will be familiar with Xena, warrior princess, oh, and Lucy, Lucy Lawless, the Kiwi that played Xena, warrior princess. Oh, she was a cute. Okay, yeah. yeah. Lucy Lawless, no less. Lawless. Lawlessness Lawless. is what heiress is about, for sure. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So when Mike Brown named her heiress before that, they were considering Xena. So that's part of why Xena comes up sometimes with heiress. Yes. Hi, cool. That was interesting about Xena and heiress. I didn't know that, but I think it really helps um, put a Southern Hemisphere twist on how to look at that asteroid. The NZ election chart has so many extremely tight, unusual aspects um, and they're short descriptions of them, so I want to take you through them. The first one is a one-minute aspect of biceptile, <clears throat> sorry, the moon, biceptile Pluto. So that's the moon in a two-seventh aspect to Pluto by one minute. You have a good intuitive sense of how various myths and legends express the deepest longings and concerns of people. You are interested in exploring the psychological depth of people and in gaining mastery over your own feelings and drives. Um, and I think election day is a perfect way for people to put their beliefs, which are informed by the, the myths and, and legends of their of their people and the values that we get from those as, as a society. It's a perfect day to express those. And um, there's a lot of psychology behind how we get to those points, and all of that comes through in an election, I feel. The second aspect that I'm pulling out is the sun in 7 sixteenths to Jupiter by three minutes. Other people may not realize how important it is to you to grow beyond your current boundaries and limits. No matter what level of success you achieve, you have your eye on the next horizon. Uh, to me, that sums up all the political parties. And we're likely to end up with a coalition, as I mentioned before. And so they're each going to be striving, anyone who makes that coalition. Your inner desire for prominence and success can incline you to sometimes exaggerate your own achievements thus far. Again, how does that not sound like a politician exaggerating their own achievements? Avoid this tendency and pursue your dreams without judging yourself strictly by your level of success. The next aspect I've pulled out is Mercury by quintile Uranus, so in two-fifth aspect to Uranus by four minutes. You have an unusually creative mind and you need outlets for your open-minded approach to life. You tend to be successful in environments where products or services are being developed or ingenuity is required. You adapt well to new ideas and you are able to identify potential in a new idea while others may overlook it because it does not fit into their preconceived notions. You have an ability to enjoy clever ideas, whether they are new gadgets or technology, a fresh approach in arts or music or any other area, without being burdened by your personal responsibilities. While others have excuses like not having enough available time to learn something new, you avail yourself to the opportunity to experience new things. So I see this day as being open to a new ensemble and a new creation. Um, to me, it's starting to sound like a change of government. What that looks like, who knows? I'll just move on to uh, a midpoint conjunct midpoint by four minutes, which is Mercury and Mars. The middle point is opposite the middle point of Uranus and Neptune. You have a youthful enthusiasm for ideas. A dry academic approach is subject 
to a subject is too dry, even deadly to you. Learning for you is a joy and you are less concerned about technical proficiency than you are in the process of discovery. You need to take lots of time to ponder the inspiring and exciting implications of an idea. And to me at the moment, that's speaking of the amount of time it takes us to know how the government is going to form after election day. We don't just count up the votes and, and know what's happening. Last is Neptune, directly opposite the Mercury-Venus midpoint. So this planet is right at that middle point between Venus and Mercury. By 10 minutes, you have imagination and vision. You are not excited about ideas that are only practical and useful. You see something that inspires awe and wonder, even in topics that may seem mundane and plain to other people. Teachers, books, and other sources of information that lack imagination are boring for you. Your great imagination and ability to understand and formulate creative ideas are big assets. You are good at interpreting and understanding fictional literature and poetry. Again, I'm seeing this drive by imagination and awe and the things that we hope for and dream of is coming through perhaps as motivators behind people's votes on the day. But to sum up my idea of the themes of the New Zealand election chart, that on the day, the energy understands people very well and there is very low tolerance for bullshit. Youthful enthusiasm and idealism is present. There's a strong need to outgrow current circumstances and strong imagination and ideals are motivating factors. We've looked at the New Zealand election chart and now we're going to look at the Tiriti chart at the time of the election. Then we're going to look at the constitution chart at the time of the election to see what they might say together. So we've gone forward in time and we're looking at this one is the Tiriti chart. All I've done here is highlighted the aspect patterns and it is what's called an ambivalent triangle so it's like an either or attitude which it's like mm, what does that mean <laughs> in terms of the treaty the upholding of the tenets of the treaty is definitely something that is front and center of te Pāti maori and the greens i haven't looked at whether you know, the two main parties have specifically mentioned Te Tiriti, but uh, the Greens and Te Pāti Māori definitely have. The symbolic picture, we've got Chiron and Pluto are so super close together, right? So you can see here Chiron on the outside, which is the 14th of October, is on the outside, the outer ring. And the birth chart of Tiriti is on the inner circle. So Pluto from Tiriti's birth chart and Chiron in the sky now, or on the 14th of October, I should say, is right on top of Pluto. So they share the same symbology, which is an empty hammock stretched between two trees. Then we have the birth sun which with the watchdog and then we have the mercury and moon in libra where we've got sea captain watching ships entering and leaving the harbor and then that destroyed boat landing that we talked about in the previous slide i use james burgess's sabian symbols uh, website i love his site and for those of you who have been intrigued by the sabian symbols that's what I would point you towards. <clears throat> and he has these one-liners for each of the symbols. We start with the red, shifting of consciousness following a catastrophic loss. That's the moon. Then we've got the mercury, reflecting upon all we have done. And then up to the top, tuning into natural rhythms. And protecting ourselves from others. The aspect pattern name is ambivalent, ambivalence, either or. Is it a choice between which? I'm not sure. 
Do either of you two want to say something to this picture? Yes, please. Right. By the way, I also love James Burgess's work. He's amazing. So yes, I agree. When you're looking at the Sabian symbols, look him up. He's prolific with writing and videos about all of the symbols. So wonderful resource there. I have, I can't remember if it's the Hubers or whoever came up with ambivalence triangle, but I have a bit of a beef with that name. Um, this is not how it reflects in most people's chart. And so I have to also then assume because the micro and the macro reflect each other in many, many ways when we're dealing with astrology, that ambivalence is not really the way of it. One of the other terms is a wedge, and sometimes it works like a wedge. However, the one that makes the most sense with the most charts that I've seen is the easy opposition. That is not to say that this is easy, but it makes the opposition easier because there is that other planet, in this case the sun, which is a luminary, not a planet. For those of you who understand astrology, you already know that, but I have to just say it. We all know that the sun is not a planet. <laughs> we also know that the moon is not a planet. They are luminaries. However, they move. Planets mean uh, moving bodies. What I'm saying here is that sun with the sextile aspect to Pluto Chiron collectively there and the trine to moon mercury is making that opposition a little bit easier to deal with oppositions can be there can be a lot of tension in an opposition that's that red line there between the two and so pulling it up with those those blue lines the blue lines can usually represent something a little bit more harmonious rather than the tension of opposites being pulled like kind of like a tug of war that's not the purpose of an opposition the purpose of an opposition is for one to reflect the other or for both to bring balance together that is the purpose but sometimes before you get to that point there is a bit of a tug of war well sun is there to say hey this is the opportunity we have with this Pluto Chiron, and this is the harmony we can create with the Moon Mercury. One of the one of the things that I'm seeing here is that the Moon Mercury of of the election chart that we'd been talking about, you know, the thoughts and feelings of the people during that time. Uh, specifically the the voters, but I think really all the people, whether they vote or not, there is tension between the people right now and more underhanded nature of things since the get go with the treaty, the things that you know there continue to be grievances about there's tension there with the people they're still feeling it to this day. They feel the wounds of it. We have Chiron there reflecting that. They're feeling the wounds of some of the not really forthright kind of power struggles with people who are in power um, because that it would be in the 10th house. There is that. There's still that tension and it's bringing up the Pluto of the treaty. That son of the treaty is part of what's the aid to that tension. This brings up what leaders of the country should have been all along. What Papa Tuanuku saw in, in who would be the leaders of this country from the conception. A watchdog standing guard protecting his master and his possessions. It's not as like possessive as it sounds. If we're looking at this from like what the the mother of the land would be would be saying here is that I need somebody who who will protect me, my people, and all of our resources 
that should be shared equally amongst each other. And there's many things throughout looking at all these charts where I'm just like, if people would realize that sometimes going back to simpler ways is not a setback, but a way to thrive. I keep seeing that over and over in everything that I'm looking at every time I look at one of these charts. It's it's in every chart that I've seen in some way, and it's coming up again. A simpler life, less consumption, less I have to have all the things. It's like scale it down is what I feel keeps being said here. And you will not only survive, but thrive. This is this is the sentiment I keep seeing underlying everything. And yeah, that's really hard. That's a really hard sell to people who have had so much convenience for so long. It's the same here. Like it's not just <laughs> New Zealand. It's a really hard sell anywhere. But if we could just like get back to the land. In Te Tariti, there is this notion of two worlds working together. Sometimes I feel like that has been shadowed out. And here we're looking at Pluto again, but sorry, Pluto, you know, I love you, but in an international chart, it's it's bringing up stuff that's underneath the surface. Very much like a volcano, when there's so much of it, it's eventually going to explode. So getting all of that under the surface out in the open is one of the most important parts of Pluto being in, you know, the top of the chart and addressing those things rather than keep sweeping up under the rug saying, oh, that's not actually a problem, things like that. I, I, I guess I don't know this for sure, but I'm guessing that there are people who are in parliament or up for election for, that are speaking to that, that we need to address these things. And there's also people who are sweeping things under the rug and saying that's not actually a problem. It seems like what keeps being said is those people who are addressing the actual underlying issues of everything are the people who really need to be heard and not ignored anymore. The people who would be that watchdog for the land and the people, those are the people who are going to make that opposition a lot easier because they actually care. They actually want to create a solution rather than ignoring the underlying the the underlying cause of things you know rather than just like putting a band-aid on whatever symptom that's what i'm seeing here they don't call pluto the excavator for nothing right <clears throat> right sometimes the roto rooter i don't know if that yeah <laughs> yep. yeah it's very appropriate for here well that compulsive motivation is there for me um, and coincides with the changes in my life that probably lead to some of the tensions in the election chart you were alluding to earlier, Felina. Um, and I guess that's a good segue into what I see in the Tiriti chart. So what I did was I, I created the uh, composite chart of the New Zealand election in Te Tiriti. And when I looked at that, there was a very tight triangle um, vibrating in the sixth harmonic. So all the aspects were under one degree. And that triangle included Mars, Neptune and Venus. So Mars being at the middle point of, of Venus and Neptune. The summary I came up with for the New Zealand election and Tetirity chart mashed together is that irrespective of what happens on election day, it's going to be really important for everyone to proceed forward with high ideals and building magic and, and creative solutions based thinking into our everyday life. Um, that's a way of saying that whether we feel happy or disappointed about the outcome of the election and what that might mean for Tetirity, it's important to go forward as though our highest dreams and, and hopes around that are going to come into fruition essentially so ultimately this is going to bring out the best in ourselves and the best in those around us one more thing really quick i think in the symbol an empty hammock stretched between two trees the empty hammock i think it needs to be filled because we've already talked about you know these two worlds two languages this 
two-ness of of this Gemini rising chart and with the empty hammock between these two there is something there that is wounding with Chiron there that needs to be healed between these two peoples these two worlds the that are meant to come together like this what i what i feel from Tetariti is that is it is the the spirit of the land saying this is this is what really needs to happen and these are some of the issues here that you're gonna have to work through over all of this time chiron there is not only just the wound of it but also the healer of it bringing out the pluto (laughs) from the depths I really feel like whatever is coming from that is 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 meant to put something substantial in place of that emptiness not filling a void or anything but something meaningful and substantial there you've just reminded me and i don't know the girl's name <clears throat> so it was like a little clip that came up on my so it might have been my insta feed and she was talking about swapping out the word decolonization which still puts the colonizer at the center and using the word re-indigenization which i loved and that's what i feel is it's that kind of um, approach and reframing of things that can fill the hammock and it's not that re-indigenization is going to separate the two it's about re-indigenization for all not not just for one of the two groups but for all there's something that you can trust in all of this is that the re-indigenization of the you know the land the people the way of life is not harmful it's not a harmful thing i think there's there's fear and i think there's a lack of trust that something good can even come of that but it's absolutely the way i think that everything is calling for not just in aotearoa but everywhere that we all i think we all saw it when everybody was in lockdown and the earth flourished Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah now we move to the constitution act and the transit chart for that. The constitution birth chart is on the inside and the election is on the outside. And this is the tipped up cradle. The birth chart, if you remember, was a cradle. And now it's almost like, okay, baby, time to get out, <laughs> get, get out of that cradle <laughs> and start walking. It's almost like, okay, time to grow up and evolve that's what it feels like to me just looking at the image of the aspect pattern here are the uh, symbols and i'm going to jump straight to what james burgess has as the one-liners for these i'm going to start at pluto epiphany of light so the original in the birth chart was an electrical storm and then over to mars sharing nostalgic memories binds us into community and then up to chiron observing the effects of unrestrained personal power over to saturn exchange ideas goods and services mindfully wow it's almost like a manifesto (laughs) from the land herself Well, that's what I'm feeling anyway. What was the first thing that had the cradle? It was the constitution birth chart. Because remember, you you said it was like conception, then birth. And I said, well, what more appropriate thing to have in a birth chart than a cradle? That's funny that the cradle came back. And it's like, hey, let's, uh, let's get this baby into the land. I find it interesting that Mars is in this one again. But from the from the election this time. Lee, you kind of just summed it up with what I was thinking about it as well, other than the upturned part, meaning that every the baby has to get to the land. I looked into the composite chart of the New Zealand election and the constitution, and there were a couple of very strong, unusual aspects. We had the sun in 11 24th to Pluto by four minutes, and we had the sun Mercury midpoint opposite 
the Jupiter-Pluto midpoint by one minute. So that's a very strong picture that it paints. And when I looked into those pictures and tried to decipher how the constitution might play out on election day, and when I say how the constitution might play out, I mean how um, how the election itself might flow, the actual structure and proceedings of the election. My summary is that proceedings should run very smoothly and have relatively high engagement. Um, although final numbers may vary from uh, quite significantly from the polls in terms of final party result numbers. Also, any talk of fraud or scamming is not likely to be an issue that arises out of this election. So I think that the proceedings of the election on the 14th are going to be relatively highly engaged and run smoothly um, without too much complaint. That's my take on things. Just under 12 hours after voting closes, we have an annular solar eclipse. It is also called the Ring of Fire, hence the picture on the top left. And we live in the Ring of Fire here in New Zealand. I don't know who decided this was a good time to have the election. If it were me, I possibly would have avoided this part of the year altogether because not only are we on the cusp of a solar eclipse, on the 11th of October, we have Pluto stationing direct. What that means is Pluto looks like he's going backwards at the moment. And when he stops and then go starts going forward again, that's what they call stationing direct in order to go forward. And it's likened to a person, um, let's say they're running in one direction and then they decide that they're gonna turn, do a 180 and go run in the opposite direction. But first they have to stop and then turn around. And in that stopping and turning around, they'll make an imprint in the ground through that stopping and then turning. So the energy is really intense. Not only do we have this solar eclipse less just under 12 hours after the election, but in the run up to the election, we've got some really crunchy energy going on. Felina and Oriselda, would you like to say something at this point about just generally about an election on the cusp of an eclipse? Yes, I would. With any eclipse, there's like major beginnings, major endings, or changes in the area where the eclipse is happening. So wherever Libra is in your own personal chart, wherever Libra is in the national chart, that's where the changes are happening. And these are accelerated changes. It's like, okay, with the solar eclipse, you're seeing what what it's like for shadow to take to blot out the light of course there's a ring of light the ring of fire like we're saying things go darker play with shadow and light if you've ever seen what happens during an eclipse outside it's so strange the birds if they're singing they stop you can sometimes see planets or stars in the sky for a little bit before the sun comes back online right it's just kind of like this um accelerated moment of change where shadow takes over then finally there's illumination again because it's a south node eclipse for the solar eclipse it's bringing up past shadows change can happen because these things have been illuminated it's kind of bringing me back to what i was saying about pluto this stuff has to bubble up to the surface and sometimes explode or you know whatever so that change can happen so transformation can happen it's very similar with these also with having an eclipse so close to election what often happens is that things are up in the air and there's possibly no definitive result immediately which as zelda kind of mentioned too that's apparently something that tends to happen with your government this is happening so close to that eclipse you may well have to wait until till after the next one to find out what what the government is actually going to look like rises and falls 
reversals of fortune, prominence where there wasn't prominence before is often par for the course. What I mentioned about Eris being at the North Node is relevant here, that there might be some chaos happening, which is like keeping things from being settled right away. It's also square Pluto, so there's revelations and stirring up ghosts of the past there as well. So it's kind of doubling down on that stirring up of the past and things coming out of that. Those are some of the things to be expected. There's some unexpected things that are part of that as well that you just never know. Good luck. (laughs) Yeah, I totally agree. Like, who picked that day? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> They're obviously not consulting astrologers there. <laughs> Even in the Maori moon calendar, I'm I'm picking that you wouldn't pick the darkest phase of the moon to be having an election. I'm going to have to look at my uh, Maramataka, but I think it's tea there. Or is it fetal? Oh, anyway. You're right, though. I mean why why pick the darkest part of the moon unless you want some things to end whoever is in charge of picking the date wants some things to end depending on what things they wanting to end that might be a good thing it might be some yeah. stuff that does need to end that they want there's to end. probably some stuff that needs to end lee <laughs> hmm. yeah. i think you guys have touched on the key points that pluto turning stationary direct and about to leave capricorn is significant and having an election where I mean, at the speed Pluto moves, it's basically still stationary by the election day. And it's interesting, like, I do wonder, with the nature of our elections being so obscured and and it's generally not quite clear who exactly is going to be in power for a while anyway, perhaps that being the standard nature of our elections would turn it around under an eclipse to, to perhaps it being the opposite, so a little bit more clear and transparent. Maybe not, though, because that's what happened in the last election when, under the MMP system, for the first time ever, and quite possibly for the last time, one single party got across the line without needing to form a coalition. That's the current government. And so there wasn't a solar eclipse last time, so perhaps that's not how it plays out. I think I will be looking for the wild card, the Uranus that's thrown in there, and maybe the the coalition we can't anticipate or something else, just something else that comes to light maybe in the middle of it all, between perhaps between um, the two eclipses, I think they call that the eclipse portal, something that we can't anticipate that's going to maybe not throw a spanner in the works because I think the energy is there for the election to play out without too much con- contesting. Yeah, there's going to be something that I can't pick. I can't. I have no idea <laughs> what the solar eclipse is going to mean. But it is interesting that, you know, this, the standard way of our election is to be unclear. And that seems to me also to be uh, what a solar eclipse might be about and the eclipse portal might indicate as well. So maybe it doubles down. Maybe all the electronic votes get wiped something unforeseen and and catastrophic but again if i'm anticipating that the election itself flows smoothly it wouldn't be that but what could it be that's that's where i'm interested to see looking two weeks later to the lunar eclipse this is like a super strong pattern it's really tight the blue on the outside sometimes that gets called a mystic rectangle then you have the two oppositions, the two red lines crossing in the middle. And what does it look like? It looks like an envelope. It looks like a ballot. Like, you know, that's where you put your vote. Right? You vote. <laughs> it's, it's so literal. It's like, it's uncanny. We have four corners of the rectangle. The moon of the lunar eclipse. The sun of the lunar eclipse. Opposite each other and Chiron and Venus opposite each other. The envelope itself is almost like you imagine like you've got this harmony on the outside that's masking like a tension on the inside. And that really speaks to me about the country at the moment. It's like, she'll be right, mate you know, is like the outside, the outside 
everything is fine, but there's lots of internal tensions, particularly Tiriti related. I was going to speak about this in an earlier slide, but I'll speak about it now. I was catching up with one of my friends who I've known since childhood, and we got on to politics because I told her about, you know, this exercise that we're involved in today and just got on to the subject and we veered into talking about what I feel are like um, the race card being played during the election. I was talking her through, so I was a public servant and part and parcel of some of the evolution of the treaty and the Waitangi Tribunal is that public servants got to go on what they called cultural awareness training. So I went on cultural awareness training when I was still living here. The cultural training educated me on what really happened with the treaty, which I was completely clueless about up until this point in my life. And I put my hand up that, you know, I swallowed all of the negative narrative about Māori people up to that point. And then once you know better, you do better. So that cultural awareness training, I knew better. I learned the double speak of the original treaty, that the Māori signed what they believed was governorship. And in the English version was sovereignty. And those two things are very, very, very different. And without making comment on the duplicitousness of it, there were two other words that could have been used in place of the word that was used in the Māori document. Those two words are mana or rangatiratanga. Either one of those words could have been used in place of sovereignty. Why were they not used? Well, I would say, or, you know, suggest that's because the chiefs would never have signed. That was one thing that I, that I would talk to my friend about, and she had no clue. She said, what? I said, yes. She goes, how come I don't know about this? And I said, well, I only know about it because I went to the, I was made to go to this cultural awareness training because I was a public servant. And then I informed her about the Public Works Act of 1908 that gave the government the right to take land without remuneration to Māori. Remuneration was given to Europeans. And that was act of law until 1974. And she said, what? <laughs> I said, yes. So, you know, there were all these things that I just gently brought to her awareness. She said to me, oh my God, Leanne. She said, I put my hand up. You know, when we started having this conversation, I was thinking, oh, you know, I surely not. And I don't understand why there is this attitude and everything else. And she said, and you know why? That's because I didn't want to feel like that I was part of the problem. And I realized that what I've been perceiving as potential redneck attitudes from people may actually be coming from the same route it was coming from with her. It's not that at all. It's that they don't want to feel like they've unwittingly contributed to this veil that's over most people's awareness of the history of this country. That's like this envelope that I'm looking at here. There's this harmonious container, but inside is this, this tension and these things that aren't spoken about or brought out into the open or brought into the light. Um, I think that was a really important chair right there. What I wanted to say for this part is that the asteroid Astrea in Te Tiriti chart is at 7.42 Aquarius square this lunar eclipse. Astrea is the, the star maiden of justice. And at this square 
all the tension of those luminaries in opposition, they pool then where the T-square is, the apex of the T-square, and that's at the conception's sense of justice. Estrella kind of reminds me of like modern day Wonder Woman. She's got this, you know, <laughs> she's got this lasso of truth and like all, <laughs> she, she's very much like a powerful uh, woman who, who's always helping, especially, you know, the downtrodden or just people in general. As the story goes, she's kind of like a bodhisattva or basically somebody who could move off the wheel of having to keep coming back and all this, but she chose to stay on earth to help the people who all the other gods thought were a lost cause. Humans are lost causes, right? We're we're going off, we're not even going to deal with them. And Astraea stayed behind and she tried to help them. Um, that's the kind of energy that Astraea has. What Teteriti is saying, because I'm still feeling this like a mother energy, you know, she's saying we have to help the people of this land. We, things have to be brought to justice. Things have to be fair. So we're coming back to this idea of fairness that we started out with, not we, you, <laughs> you all are going to be starting out with when you go to vote because there was such a Libra emphasis then. Estrella has that kind of Libra feeling, like she wants things to be fair and equal and justice is going to be served. And she'll do it in a nice way, but it will be served. <laughs> I'm noticing that she's not that far from Characlo, was it 846 Aquarius? Oh yeah, yeah. Characlo, she was Chiron's wife. She held space for the healing of others, including her husband. She basically was a facilitator of healing whereas her husband Chiron would be more of a teacher of healing right she was the one who would hold the space put that together with Astraea and here we are holding the space for healing and justice and that is where the tension of the lunar eclipse pools and that's the most actional direct way that it's going to come across so I think that's a really good thing honestly to see that go from a lot of tension <laughs> to, you know, something actional that brings healing and that brings justice. And I like that the moon is with Juno. So that would be the moon of the lunar eclipse with Juno of the treaty. Okay, yeah. Juno happens to be, of among many things, she is a supporter of women. She is, you know, feminine empowerment. She's a midwifing kind of energy, so she brings things to birth. She aids that process. There is that, but she is also conscious partnership and all the difficulties and wonders of what partnership can be and especially a committed partnership and it, there's you know there's always a committed partnership or there should be with what you know the leaders of the country are how they are in relation to the people what they are promising is like a vow or it should be don't say it unless you mean it that kind of thing yeah <laughs> What's interesting is the comparison of Te Tiriti and then the Constitution Act pattern. Both of them have this envelope. And now we have the oppositions in the eclipse chart is Jupiter, Black Moon Lilith, opposite Mercury. Mercury is the tightest, and Mars is there too. And then the other opposition, Neptune and Mars. So Mars features twice. And we don't just have an envelope, but we also have a kind of a kite. 
I guess like Sal does use this expression before, a wonky kite <laughs> that is actually pointing towards the tip of this kite is Jupiter and Black Moon Lilith, Neptune and Pisces, Mars and Scorpio, very strong, strong signatures. Sorry, Mars and Virgo, beg your pardon, um, Mars and Scorpio up here. And then Jupiter and Black Moon Lilith in Taurus, Taurus the land. So each eclipse belongs to an eclipse family and this eclipse family started, so it's like a, a moon cycle in of itself and it's usually one moon. For eclipses, it's six moons. <laughs> and so the actual whole family is much longer. We started the new moon for this family was on the 30th of April 2022. Aselda might know of something that happened in New Zealand at that point. I don't because I wasn't living here. But I do know that Jacinda Ardern stepped down on the 25th, I think it was, of January this year from her post as Prime Minister. So that was on the first quarter of this eclipse family cycle and now we're approaching the lunar eclipse will be the full moon of this eclipse family cycle so then the last date to finish off this cycle will be the 28th of July next year and now that I'm looking at this envelope it looks like it's kind of half open with a bit sticking out so it's almost like it's going to be opened out. We'll know our result either on or not, not too far off the lunar eclipse. Mm. 29th of October. Yeah. Mm, that'd be a good prediction to see if that comes to fruition. Uh, one, of, one of the things that I find interesting here is that this is a kite pattern that is already existent in the Constitution Act. And then Jupiter from the eclipse, as well as Mercury and Mars here, they're strengthening basically the the opposition within that configuration. We have the, both of the Jupiters. So what we're getting here is um, a strengthening of a pattern that is pre-existing. The strengthening is coming from Mars Jupiter opposition, well, also with Jupiter opposite Mercury. So, this is interesting. I have two children, and both of them were born with Jupiter opposite Mars. Leaving Mercury aside just for a moment, both of them have it in fixed signs, just like this. The Scorpio, <laughs> this, this is funny, Scorpio Taurus. That, that opposition is with my 17-year-old daughter, except it's flipped. Essentially, what this aspect is, it's actually very lucky. And it's the kind of luck where this energy wants to do something that might be a bit risky, and yet they always, they're always kind of like a cat that always lands on their feet. They don't get too banged up. <laughs> it's that kind of energy. What I would say is that it's being, you know, this pre-existing uh, configuration is being kind of amplified and strengthened by this kind of risky, risk-taking kind of luck, right? Um, and then the, the Mercury part of it is just adding to the, you know, part of that luck has to do with saying what comes immediately to you. That's the Mars part. Okay, we're, we're saying the immediate Mars and Scorpio thing. Leanne has a Mar Mars and Scorpio. She can probably attest to, you know, sometimes needing to be very blunt about things, right? Well, this is that combination there. Um, and Jupiter to be like, you know, you can, you can say a whole lot and it might be a little cutting, might be a little blunt, but it might be well received as well, you know, because Jupiter's there saying, eh, it's... It's beneficial what's being said, even if it's a little bit 
cutting. I guess what that means for that time period as it relates to the Constitution and the election that's happening is by that point, things will probably be a bit more clear. It's not beating around the bush. It's things are things are coming out at that point, I think. That's what I that's all I have. Well my last observation would be that we remember that the treaty and the constitution are two documents tied together and it's interesting to see these two strong mystic rectangles appearing in both and referring back to what Lee was saying earlier it's very much this should we write on the outside and um working on these hidden tensions on the inside and to me it indicates that both charts both aspects of New Zealand's natality are driven and motivated to uh, find creative solutions to the problems. So that all right on the outside, that's what we want, that's what we're projecting, and that's what we're going to work to get, despite and stemming from the internal tensions. That's a good way to look at it. I like that. I really like that. That felt like a really good like summary line to finish this with, Iselda. Thank you. <laughs> there you go. <laughs>